Well, welcome back to another RD Works Learning Lab. Today we're going to carry on with the head transplant um, for this little China Blue machine. Now, I've got a pretty fair idea that it will work because the Mark I worked extremely well. So I've got no reason to suspect that the Mark II will be any worse. Hopefully, easier to use and better. And then I can make the drawings available to you guys. Now, before we start ripping that head apart, I just wanted to show you something. Although this is a bracket that's made of aluminium and technically it should be quite stiff, if we take a look at it, you'll see that I can actually, without too much load, I can actually move the head. It has got some float on it. So we need to just keep an eye on that and see whether or not my plastic bracket is actually stronger or weaker than the aluminium one. Okay, so that's part one, head removed. Now part two, we've got to remove this bracket. Now if you're doing a modification of your machine from square one, you'll find that when you take the head off, you've got this plate here, which holds the chain. Now it will have a flange sticking out the side here, and you can see probably where I have machines and just ground off, I've cut the flange off and just ground it back so that it's flush. So that I don't have to make any alternative arrangements for fixing the chain and the, uh, and the air assist pipe. So I've left that in place. What we'll now do is screw our plastic alternative plate back in place. One bracket mounted on there, and that actually feels very stiff. Before I tighten this bracket up, I ought to make sure that it's sitting upright. It is just the merest amount out, so what I can do is just loosen the screws off, and I've got just a small amount of clearance in there which will allow me to twist that so that it's absolutely vertical. So what we're going to do is just put a washer underneath the head of each screw and fix everything together. Right, well as you can see, this bracket is not quite as strong as I thought it was going to be and it actually flexes on this corner here. And there's nothing that I can do about that except replace it with the stiffer aluminium bracket. So let's try the plastic bracket on the aluminium back plate. Still a little bit more give in that than there was in the aluminium one. But sadly, this aluminium bracket does not fit this head. Well, we're going to have one simple go at trying to fix this problem before I have to make a new bracket. And look, I've actually cemented a piece of 10 millimeter thick acrylic right along the bottom edge. Now, that's really going to stiffen the corners up. Well, now that my great big stiffening lump that I put along the back there has dried, um, we should find that this is significantly improved, which it has. But I think there's still as much flex there now as there was on my aluminium bracket to start with. Now, we must look at the positives from this plastic bracket disaster, because without it, I might not have discovered what was actually going on a week ago when I mounted the Mark I head on my supposed stiff aluminium bracket. As I was running my little dot test to try and get the smallest and best dots for each one of these lenses, I kept on noticing a strange pattern in my data. We need to go and have a look at this under the microscope so that you can actually see for yourself what I saw but did not understand. Now, here's what I want you to see. This is my little dot test, which I was using to set up the focus when I was establishing a focus point for each of the lenses in my Mark I head. Now, something that puzzled me was, as I was looking at them, wherever I looked, I kept on seeing the same pattern. 
whatever lens I was using so what on earth is going on right well let's just stop here for a moment and have a quick look at this one for the top row it runs left to right and then for the middle row it runs right to left and the bottom row runs left to right that pattern starts off wobbly and starts getting closer to a straight line as we get towards the other end it probably only takes about a second to draw the whole of that top line because it only takes about three seconds to draw the whole of the pattern so what on earth could be producing this wobbly line it's obviously a problem in Y and I thought ah must be the stepper motor overdriving now because we've taken all the mass away from the head and it's trying to settle down hey think about that a second stepper motors do not go past their aiming point unlike servo motors which can drive past their aiming point and come back stepper motors slow down to reach their aiming point Mm. so it's definitely not the stepper motor being overpowered and again we've got a small motion between the end of the first line and the beginning of the second line on the right hand side there but you'll notice that the first dot or two are still a little bit wavy in fact the whole of that line is very gently wavy if you look and the head immediately jumps down to the left hand end of the bottom line and here again look we've got this waviness in Y and it continues pretty well all the way along if it's not the stepper motor it must be the beam that's moving let's go back to the machine and I'll explain how all of a sudden my mistake with this silly plastic bracket has given me the answer to this question okay well I'm not going to tell you exactly what the problem is here I'm going to push on and set this up despite this dodgy bracket now let's remember that I haven't actually messed around with the X or the Y axis so technically my X axis along here is still perfectly in line now we're going to use my test piece to set up approximately set up the head to start with. So we we'll do a, a low power pulse to start with and see where we are and we're a little bit low so we need to drop the head down to catch the beam remember so we've got to drop it down about three millimeters about there let's check it a little bit high now so we've got to come up a bit pretty much on centre so we'll lock the height and now we'll set the in out position and we've got to press the head in a bit probably near enough to start with so now we've got to remove the lens and the nozzle and what we're going to do now is to check whether or not the beam is running down true so we have no idea at the moment because we haven't set the mirror up well we'll leave the table where it is because it's um, near the top of its stroke anyway so we do a pulse there let's just move that out of the way do a pulse there oh that's way way out of line so I think we ought to pull that roughly into the center and we do that by steering the beam that way pushing the mirror out
bit more, bit more. Just check, and then we need to go back. So we need to push that one in. Right, okay. So now we'll start off with it approximately in the middle of here. And we do a pulse. We drop the table down. We need to go down probably at least, I don't know, four, four inches, something like that to get a reasonable distance between where we started from and where we are now. Okay, now we'll do another pulse. And surprisingly enough, they're not that far out. The aim of the exercise is to get the second pulse on top of the first pulse. And so we want to send that pulse very slightly forward, which means we need to pull this mirror back. That's nearly there, actually. About there. Pulse. And now we drop it down. Still got to come forward just a shade. And we put, let that mirror off. And that's probably not far out. So now what we've done, we've got the beam lined up perfectly in Z. And now what we've got to do is make sure that the beam, we've got to ignore the setting that we put at the front here now and what we've got to do is adjust the mirror so that the beam actually passes down the center of the of the nozzle and the lens we know it's upright so all we've got to do is move the head into position now and we will have the perfect alignment for z so let's see where we are so we need to first of all adjust the head out very slightly <coughs> So we can loosen the head off and just pull it across very slightly and that looks pretty central. Now the question is we want to get the beam to go back. Now how do we get the beam to go back? Now we've got to imagine what's happening to the beam. It's coming in here and it's going down. But it's going down too high on the mirror. It's hitting the mirror early and going down. So we want the beam to go down later on the mirror. So what we've got to do is lift the head up very slightly. Maybe too much, let's check. No, a little bit more. There we go, that's probably about it. Let's put another target in and check. There we go. I don't think we can get a lot better than that. So now we feel fairly safe about putting our lens in here because we're very confident that the beam is going to pass right down the axis of the lens and right out the centre of this nozzle, we hope. <laughs> now this particular lens holder is actually what would normally be known as a two and a half inch lens holder. But because I'm using such a short nozzle, this two and a half inch lens holder actually becomes a two inch lens holder. So now I need a 20 millimeter two inch lens to go in there and at the moment the only 20 mil lenses that I've got are for my light blade machine. So we're going to have to nick a lens off of the light blade and pop it in here. Now this two inch lens, as you see, it sits right at the back here. Okay. Now we'll drop our nozzle in. I won't bother with the air assist tube at the moment. We'll drop our nozzle in. We'll lift this up and we'll pop our two inch lens in there. And we'll just make sure that it's nicely lined up which I think it is, because this is sitting right down. Now 
Now what I need to do now is roughly find where the focal length is. Oh, it's up quite high. I don't need to do any more setting on this head, but what I am going to do is to show you now the problem that we looked at under the microscope. Now we've got this running at 60 millimeters a second and 13% power. And I'm going to run my little test pattern. And I think you can see very clearly, in fact, that is worse than what it was with the Mark I head. We can see here, the top line starts off wobbly and gets reasonably okay. The second line has got wobbles on it and the third line jumps from there down to the bottom and as it starts off it wobbles quite hard and stops. I've not done this before but I'm very confident I know what the problem is. I demonstrated to you how this bracket had some flex in it and then I've shown you that this bracket has even more flex in it. Okay. So let me do two things. First of all, I'm going to put a little bit of load on it and I'm going to do a pulse. And now I'm going to put a little bit of pressure on it and do a pulse. And let's see what we've got. Look, we've got two distinct pulses. What I'm just about to show you demonstrates absolutely clearly why it is so important to get the beam travelling first of all straight downwards and secondly on the centre line on the axis of the lens. If it doesn't hit the central axis point of that lens the beam steers off and look what happens when I move this bracket very slightly. Can you see the head is moving from side to side? Okay, it's moving backwards and forwards slightly, but that's not going to change the position of the x-axis. The x-axis is still going to strike the same position. What it is going to do, it's going to move, effectively move the lens. As you can see, the lens is moving. So the lens is moving off the central axis of the beam. We set it up true, but as soon as we start moving this head with sharp motions, we're setting up oscillations in the head and that's what we're picking up when we're looking at our test pattern. Remember what I've said to you, this head is a fantastic velocity checker. It tells you exactly what's going on. Now there was me thinking that this problem was all to do with the stepper motors but as I described to you earlier that cannot be the case and then it just clicked. I know what the problem is. The bracket is not stiff enough. This bracket was not stiff enough and so the head was actually moving around. So what I've now got to do, we've got to abandon this here for a couple of days while I go away and design and get manufactured a heavy duty steel bracket that will make sure that even if I've got some small oscillations there, the frequency of those oscillations will be so high and the amplitude so small that we won't notice them when we do our test pattern. Now you know if you see any patterns like this, and I have seen this on people's work and thought that it was something to do with the interference of the stepper motors playing against each other. We can see clearly now that it's not. On the front of the head here, they often put a little bracket strapping the front side of the head back to here. So if you do remove that little teeny weeny strap that they put on there, which looks like a bodge, um, well, you'll be exposing yourself to a risk of this sort of problem because this is a much heavier head on a much flimsier bracket than the one that I've got here. We're now a couple of days later and as you can see I've actually fitted a head up here with a modified bracket to stiffen up my original aluminium bracket and that seems to work fairly well but of course in the meantime as I promised you I was going to be designing uh, a bit of an overkill solution in stainless steel. While that was 
taking place and the manufacture of that bracket was happening. I took a look at my original version here and I decided that the nozzle itself was close to the work but I decided that the table was coming up right to the top of the lead screws. So what I've done, I've gone away and look, I've added about 15 millimeters or so to the bottom of an alternative version. It's the same design, but just 15 millimeters lower. Okay, now that works extremely well. I have done some test work on it, so we're not gonna bother with that particularly. But what I am going to do now is to show you and we will just carry out one or two tests on my alternative bracket. So as we can see, I've just put a stiffening bracket on here and that makes a tremendous difference. On my little dot test, the wobble has 99% disappeared now. And here is the bracket. It's made of stainless steel, three millimeter stainless steel from laser cut parts, which have just been very lightly welded together in a few places. Okay, now, it's got two tapped holes in it here, M4 tapped holes, and we've got a location slot in here, which allows me to put this bracket on and adjust it up and down. Okay, now if I've designed this right, it will also fit in there. I might have to just file that gap out just to shade because it's just not quite fitting. All right, but it will do when I just put a little file in there. Okay, so now my my horizontal slidey bracket is there. And as you can see here, my super ultra stiff little stainless steel bracket fixes on and I can now bolt this straight back onto it. So I set them roughly to the middle of the slots. And this one as well, approximately in the middle of the slots. I'm gonna pop one of my paper targets in here and see where our pulse is. I saw some smoke. Oh, there it is. So, that's pretty miraculous, isn't it? Look, it's spot on center height-wise, but we've just got to adjust it out a little bit. Well, I think that is probably near enough center to not worry about any more, because we've got to adjust this later anyway we're just trying to get it roughly to the center of the mirror okay so now we move on to phase two which is to take the lens out and unplug the nozzle and take that out as well because we've now got to set the z axis up with this mirror so just put a piece of clean card down on the table there and we'll raise the table up more or less as high as it will go. There we go. We're, we're about an inch away from the top of the table. So what I'm now going to do is to try and get this beam approximately, just approximately in the center of this hole at the bottom here. Okay, so we'll just do a quick pulse and find out where it is. We just, we, because, <laughs> great thing about it is that because this is all um, acrylic you can look through the acrylic and see approximately where it is on center that way but it's not this way so we basically need to tip the mirror over by twisting this in and I would say that that's now not far off center in that plane as well okay so I would just Put a nice clean dot down, one. Now we'll drop the table down about four inches. That was our first mark. Now we'll find out where our second mark is. Okay, it's a little bit out. So I've got to let the mirror 
I've got to get the beam back that way, which means I've got to let the mirror off a little bit in that plane. Check. A little bit more. Not bad. Now we've got to go and set it in the other plane. We've got to move it across, so I've got to let the mirror off again. A bit more. I would say that's probably not far out. So what we do is repeat this whole check again. Nice black pulse. And there we go. Pretty good. Okay, so now we've guaranteed that we've got our beam running absolutely vertical downwards to the table, both in that plane and in this plane. Having it running vertically down does not mean to say it's running right through the central axis of the lens. So that's the next thing that we're going to test for, whether or not the beam is running down the centre of the lens. So let's test this. And as you can see, the answer is no. It's a little bit too far forward and slightly out in this plane. Now, that's very easy because as far as backwards and forwards is concerned, all we've got to do is to move the head backwards, just a shade. Maybe too much that. Let's test it. No, that's just about right. So we can, we've got that bit set now. We don't need to adjust the mirror anymore because the mirror is now set. The only thing that we can do is to mess around with the position of the head. Now at the moment that beam is too far forward on centre and if you think about that if you project it up it's hitting the mirror high above centre. So to get the beam further back we have to move the mirror to a different position to catch the beam lower down on the mirror and to catch the beam lower down on the mirror we've actually got to raise the head okay and we'll see what we've done yeah not enough got to raise it a bit more and i do believe that's pretty near central so we just put a clean target in there and check that one more time. And how about that? So that means now that beam is not only running absolutely vertically downwards, it's running downwards through the axis of the lens. So when I plug my nozzle back in, we will put some, uh, we will put the air assist on, we'll just plug that pipe in there and we'll pop our lens in. And then we'll make sure that it's sitting down snugly, flat, like that, which it is. So everything is now absolutely perfectly lined up. The quickest and best way that I've found to set the focus up is to use my little dot test. The finest lines that I can get give me the best focus point. Now I'm going to run this test at about 100 millimetres a second. When I look at this through my little eyeglass here, first of all, I can see that there is absolute perfection in the quality of the lines themselves. The dots are not bad, but they're certainly not in focus. So that was eight millimeters. We're now gonna find out whether maybe seven millimeters is the right distance, or whether I've got to go up. And that's getting worse. So we'll go back up to nine now and see what happens at nine millimeters. And a quick check. Oh yes, nine millimeters is looking substantially better. Not a huge difference between nine and 10. I would say nine is better. So that lens there, which is a, a two inch focal length lens, 
needs to be set at 9 millimeters and this is the way that now I find my focal distance for a lens. Surprisingly enough if you increase the power or the speed you may well find that you have to change the focal distance by maybe half or one millimeter to get a really good crisp line again. So all I've got to do now is just change the lenses in here and work out what the various focal lengths are, the distances for the various focal length lenses. You don't need to watch me do that. Yeah. I'm going to have to go away and do a few tests on this to make sure that it is what it looks like really nice and stable um, but I can't see now that it's going to change it's it is really a well engineered bracket the only problem is I've had a couple more days to think about this you've got to buy lens tubes and modify them you've got to modify the bottom and you've got to cut the top off you've also got to buy a nozzle or make a nozzle for yourself now many people won't have the ability to make that nozzle and they'll want to buy it from me. But to be honest, I don't want to sell them because I don't want to make them. I've made it for myself, but as I tried to tell you many times before, I'm a bit of a selfish person. You know, I'm showing you what I'm doing. This is not something I really want to sell. But let me show you something else. Well, welcome to the Mark four. Yeah, I've had a couple of days to think about it yet again for my own selfish convenience and for your benefit. I'm not showing you what I'm doing. What I'm going to do, we're going to set this up in exactly the same way that we did the previous one. And a little bit low, so we need to just raise that up. That's near enough for what we want to start with. Let's use this piece of paper again to get ourselves roughly lined up. So we'll drop the table down and see how far we are out. Wow, look at that. <laughs> Was that... Perhaps I'll go and do the lottery numbers now. Okay, so we've now set the beam straight downwards in both planes. Now at the moment I don't have any targets the right size to fit in here, but I can drop a target into there and align it fairly accurately so I've got to make some paper targets that will just drop into that hole there. Okay, so now that means I've got to move this head inwards to catch that beam. And I must tighten it up because it might take up a slightly different angle. Oh, look at that. Spot down the middle. Well, here's the answer. It's a standard lens tube with no modifications at all and a standard nozzle with no modifications at all. And what we're going to do is we're going to slip that lens tube into there like that. So there we are, put the nozzle through the bottom and now I'm screwing the lens tube down onto the nozzle. So we've just plugged the air assist in and Hey presto, we've got a system that works. And this two and a half inch nozzle has got around about, I think, a seven millimeter focal distance. So let's take a look at what I've done here. We've got a standard lens tube that you can fit, a standard fitting underneath, the only thing that's special is the bracket that mounts this onto so here. So I can provide you with the, with the drawings for all of this um, because the only thing special now really are these springs which I can give you a specification for the springs and you can buy them. There's nothing else special on here at all for me to make. The only thing that I would have to supply you with for those people that cannot is the bracket the stainless steel bracket so that you can modify your own machine and bolt this unit back on. So that was my goal to try and duck out of any selling of items. Haven't quite been able to achieve it but you can make most of this yourself and you, as you can see I've had three designs now, almost four designs and I've arrived at this one 
which suits all of my requirements. Modifying as little as possible using standard equipment wherever possible. Um, you make your own mirror holder here but you use a standard mirror. The only special part as I said are the springs and this bracket at the back here. So this is the Mark IV. The only thing by going for this approach is as a standard you can only use a two, two and a half or a four inch lens. There is no facility in here for turning this into a, a one and a half inch lens system. But I already have modified this particular nozzle here to take a one and a half inch lens system. With a slightly different design of nozzle here, we'd have to modify the nozzle both internally and externally. I could even make it do the compound lens. You need two nozzles. This one for the one and a half inch, two inch, two and a half and four inch lens and then a special modified nozzle to take the compound lens if you wanted a compound lens. So here's the historical progression Mark 1, Mark 2, Mark 3 and Mark 4. Now there was one final test that I didn't carry out on this Mark 4 and we'll do that just before we finish. And that's using my little, let's call it laser thermometer. It does a quick check of whether or not the beam is coming down through the centre of the nozzle. So if I pop that on the nozzle now and do a pulse, hopefully you can see that, that's pretty central. So I know that it's not in any way hitting the nozzle. Well, all I've got to do now is to clear up all the carnage that I've got inside this machine and then I can start doing some serious test work. So thanks for your time. Let me know what you think about this and I'll see about getting some drawings ready to release to you guys and sort of giving a, give an impression of you know if you want the bracket made um, I need an idea of how many people might be interested so that I can get a costing for the bracket. I, couldn't, I can't see that it's going to cost a fortune because there are only four pieces that have got to be laser cut. So, and then just a little teeny weeny bit of welding. Chuck it in an envelope and put it in the post. So, at the moment, my guess is somewhere in the region of about £15, maybe £20 maximum for that bracket assembly in the post to you. But I've got to, I've got to get the costing sorted out. Thank you very much for your time and I'll catch you in the next session.